So to start, Skip, first of all, hello. Thank you so much for joining me today. Um, could you start by, yeah, could you start by introducing yourself? Okay, uh, my name is Skip Conover. I'm 73 years old. You asked for my age, profession, and so on. And I live in uh, Annapolis, Maryland, the capital of the state of Maryland in the U.S. My main profession has been a business executive, but uh, I've been through uh, many lives, let's say. I started my career after college in the U.S. Marine Corps. I attended, I went to uh, Vietnam in 1970. When I came back, I stayed in the reserve, and so I ultimately served 23 years as a Marine Corps officer. And I retired as a lieutenant colonel. You're probably too young to remember my, my classmates. You might have heard of Oliver North, I suppose. He was a classmate of mine. And, uh, uh, and there's a couple of others, uh, Senator Jim Webb uh, wow. and um, Rich Higgins, who was uh, murdered by Hezbollah in uh, 1989, as he was the commander of UN peacekeepers in Lebanon at the time. So after that, but during that time, I, I went to law school. I practiced law for five years. Um, I went to business school while practicing law. And then I took on a job at leading a company in Japan where I had gone to high school 16 years earlier. And, um, and so I did that for five years. And ever since then, I've basically been a business executive. I did teach uh, finance for a couple of years at the University of Maryland Graduate School. But um, besides that, I, up until, let's say, 2008, I was uh, a very serious business executive and founded a company that became a public company. Um, and then uh, after that, I've been essentially retired. <laughs> uh, there's more gory details in there, but I think that's probably enough for your, yeah. uh, for your purposes. Um, I, I, I read I read about your bio, and I was I was like overwhelmed by how much you've done. I was really impressed. So, yeah. <laughs> so, meanwhile, really, um, yeah, it is it isn't easy to live a life, right? for any of us because uh, the, this is a very chaotic time and we're all um, we're all faced with way too much information and uh, you know a statistic that I commonly use is that uh, 400 years ago in the 16th century the average human being would be presented in a lifetime as much information as is in one edition of the Sunday U uh, New York Times today. So, uh, <clears throat> so obviously as we've opened up the internet over my lifetime, um, and just to give you orders of magnitude, uh, my wife and I claim to be the first couple to meet online and marry. And uh, three days ago, we celebrated the 35th anniversary of our meeting online and uh, and this weekend will be the 35th anniversary of our first physical meeting. And um, that's incredible. That what, what, what site Pardon? was that? What, what website was that? Uh, it was, it, there was no website at that time. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The web didn't get going until 1995, but there were, um, there were email networks before then. And uh, so we met on an email network called The Source, believe it or not. <laughs> and uh, we met because I was going to uh, China to, to uh, the first or the second annual International Secondhand Machinery Trade Fair in Hangzhou, China. And I was looking for other plant and equipment that I could represent 
uh, in China. And uh, I sent one of the first spams to 35 people on the source who had listed, um, who had listed entrepreneurship as an interest. And <laughs> so, so I got one response from my wife and she, uh, and so what I got out of that trip was a, was a new wife. And uh, so she was representing a, a cigarette manufacturing company uh, that had, it had three cigarette manufacturing facilities in the US, but it was closing one of them. And so I ended up representing that facility in China for that trade fair. Uh, I never ended up making any money out of that, although I think their equipment was ultimately sold to China. But um, but I got yeah. cut out of the deal. <laughs> but I did get a wife out of it. And, That's a great story. Uh, and and so if if any of your listeners know of anybody that met online before August the 22nd, 1985, they should contact me. But wow. uh, so far, I haven't heard of any wow, that's uh, that have both met online and married. <laughs> it's incredible. Wow. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, go ahead. If we could jump into uh, BTS. So how did Absolutely. you discover BTS? OK. Um, well, one of the things I was leading up to here is, first of all, how did I, why did I discover uh, Carl Jung's work? And uh, that was, what I wanted to say was that throughout the last 33 years, I've been in a kind of chaotic uh, world that we all live in. And it's only been thanks to his uh, psychology that has seen me through and helped me find my way through the chaos. And so I have a friend who is a Jungian analyst. She's now living in New Mexico, but she was living in New York at the time. And she happens to have two um, Korean American uh, adopted children. And they were crazy about BTS. And she mentioned she mentioned it on Twitter, uh, probably in late March of last year, 2019. And it was just before the, the, um, the persona, the soul the persona, soul per, persona yeah. album came out. Yeah. And of course, because of my long study in Dr. Young's work, I've, I was well aware of Mary Stein's book called Map of the Soul, uh, Jung's Map of the Soul, an introduction. Okay. And so I started to get into it uh, a bit and I realized that they had done that album that was released last April, week, a year ago in April, um, based entirely on uh, Mary Stein's book. And I know Mary Stein from other activities. In fact, I interviewed him um, 16 days ago, and that interview has had over has had uh, 7,235 hits as of today in 16 days, because uh, the BTS crew was so interested in what he was saying. And but going back to April. Um, I started to look into it, and as soon as I did, on Twitter, many armies approached me, and uh, a couple of them have become uh, very good friends. I have a very good uh, BTS friend in Brazil who has guided me through their work uh, quite a bit, and we've interviewed about it over time. and. Um, and so I was seeing how enthusiastic all the armies were about, uh, about the album. And so as soon as I started to mention it on my YouTube channel, oh my God, I suddenly got 
an incredible number of followers and so on, new followers. And uh, so I, I got more and more into it and I became uh, very impressed with what they're doing to educate young people. And I said, wow, you know, here, here's one, one thing that I'm interested in. I'm interested in educating young people about psychology very early, okay? In other words, sixth or seventh grade level, because after that time, um, that people get very fixed ideas and, and they don't really understand what it is that they need to learn to be a functioning, mature human being in our current society. And I had thought for many, many years about how can we get young people to be interested in this. And suddenly I realized, oh my God, here's BTS, which has this following at that time of 80 million people. I have no idea how, how big the following is today. Now, maybe you can tell me, but, um, but at that time it had 80 million armies <laughs> and, and, uh, and they were getting people to read books and read, read the books I wanted them to read, namely uh, Herman Hesse and Jung and so on. And I said, wow, this is terrific because not only do they have a fan base in the armies, but they're actually showing the armies through music videos and so on, what these, what these ideas are about, what these psychological ideas are about through their mu uh, music videos. And, and so that incredibly impressed me and, and uh, they probably have done more for education than any educator in the last 50 years because who else has uh, reached people in every country and uh, caused people to want to learn. Okay, that was what I was really impressed with. And um, so- Are there any, uh, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, then, then you asked, uh, it sounds like you've really connected with their music, why? Yeah, um, yeah. Well, first of all, I, I like the lyrics very much because the lyrics do um, reflect Jungian ideas. And it, it, as I did on the interview I did with Murray, uh, here's the book. Okay, we were talking about this book on the interview that I did with Murray. And so what Murray has done since last year is he's recast a couple of his books uh, to be tailored more toward BTS because he recognized, of course, he had written, written that book um, 25 years ago or so. And it had a, probably a very limited following at that time. But once BTS put it on, his, on their website, oh my God, then he, he started to sell it like crazy. And so in this book, um, the Map of the Soul 7, Persona, Shadow, and Ego in the World of BTS, what he's done is he's provided a uh, psychological interpretation for each of the tracks in both albums, Map of the Soul, Persona, and uh, Map, Map of the Soul 7. And so that... Uh, obviously is very valuable in terms of helping people understand what Jungian psychology is because it's quite different from you know the traditional psychologist today who wants to drug you up and wants to finish a, a visit with you in 10 minutes <laughs> and it can't really they can't really help yeah. you yeah. Uh, they can they can pave over your pain but they with drugs but they can't really solve your problems and what you need to develop and and to become a, a fully functioning adult human being so 
Um, so, yeah, so it's the lyrics, obviously, I think the dancing and costuming is quite um, eye catching and, and interesting. Um, it's, I think it's hilarious to watch uh, macho men uh, be shown BTS for the first time on YouTube. There are a number of YouTube videos about that. And that's, I, I think it's hilarious to watch it because they're not turned off instantly. And, and um, that's, it's partially surprising, but it's also understandable from my point of view because of uh, understanding the way psychology works. But um, anyway. Okay, go ahead. Sure. Yeah. So I know I I know you've tweeted that you're an army, and so I'm curious sure. why you consider yourself part of this BTS army, this fandom. Well, I'm I'm just a total fan of what they're doing. I th I think uh, Mr. Bang, who's behind them, um, and uh, and the young men themselves are. Um, doing a brilliant thing for the for a world of young people and you know i know there's this perception that it's only young women who are interested but that's not true at all i don't think i mean i think it's largely true it may be a larger percentage are interested than young men but what i know from the beatles time is that um where the where the young women go, the men will follow. <laughs> and so I suspect if we looked at, at statistics, demographics of the BTS army over the last 18 months, you would see uh, larger and larger percentages uh, being young men as well. Um, and, um, and I think the phenomenon is, um, very comparable to uh, the Beatles, which is uh, the group that was very uh, notable in my time. Um, you know, I, I think that young women who are uh, just in, in early puberty maybe um, are perhaps threatened by mature uh, he-men men and so the Beatles started to scratch the surface of being more feminine seeming, um, not that they were effeminate, but that more feminine seeming because they were wearing long hair, which was not, uh, not de rigueur in the early 1960s, let's say. And uh, when I look at their hair now, <laughs> I see my gosh, they were so conservative. But when they were uh, popular, you know, my parents, all the parents were saying, oh my God, their hair is so long, blah, blah, blah. And so now people have to make more and more efforts to uh, get attention. But I think the fact that these young men are willing to show a feminine side is a good thing. And it's, and young women react to that because it's not threatening to them um, at, at that age. And so, um, you know, I, uh, anyway, then I guess that's all I have to say about that. I don't, I don't know anything about sexual orientation of these fellows at all. So uh, I shouldn't well, say more about it, but. Well, do you, do you have a bias? Well, I, my bias is with RM only because uh, I've heard him speak a number of times. And the, the first time I heard him, uh, speak was at, at the UN and I thought that the speech he gave, it was a short speech, but it, it was really a very fine speech and uh, re reflected the maturity of somebody twice his age or more. And uh, so I think that that, uh, that really impressed me. 
And other than that, I, you know, I don't have a particular bias per se. Uh, I, I tend to watch for RM when they're uh, performing, but, um, but I, I like the group as a group. Uh, so <laughs> I, I couldn't say that that he's he's the only one I like them right. all. Right. Um, Great. Um, so have you because you know we've you talked about how well there's certainly that that perception that you know all BCS fans are young girls and obviously the mm -hmm. truth is more complicated than that as you said. So have you ever experienced judgment yourself from others? for having an appreciation for this group? Well, not a lot. Uh, I have had some, not before I had an appreciation for the group. I already had established an appreciation, but uh, I think one reason that some people have encouraged you to interview me is because I've gone to bat for BTS a number of times, uh, and especially for armies a couple of times because uh, there have been a number of people who've said things like, oh, this is all young girls. And I said, well, you know, I'm a retired Marine and retired business executive. And I'm, oh, by the way, last year when I put this up, I was 72. Now I'm 73. I'm 73 year old man. And, uh, you know, I served a career, career in the U.S. Marines. Uh, so what have you done, Sonny? <laughs> you know? Great response. Great response. Uh, <laughs> you know, and, and so, you know, the, it's just a, it's just a super, it's people that, that talk back in that way are threatened. Okay. Because they, yeah. they, uh, don't understand it. They don't understand it because they're not mature enough to understand it. And, and so they think that they can dis BTS by making, you know, um, flaccid comments like this, <laughs> you know, and uh, it just doesn't work. Um, and so, you know, and there have been a few occasions where where people have made nasty comments and then the next thing you know there'll be a response to the comment which which will direct it to me on um twitter and then i i normally come in with <laughs> with both guns blazing and and these people normally back down you're really breaking um, that stereotype you know <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah. It's gonna restart my camera for one second. Sorry, I'm just oh, sorry. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, based on, on that, I, I'm I'm curious. What would you? I mean, you've kind of said it, but if for people who do dismiss dismiss BTS because of this mm -hmm. idea that their fans are just young young girls, what would you say to them? If you had something, to, if you had something else you wanted to say, what would you say? I would say to find out what the girls are interested in and why, uh, what they're really interested in, because um, what, what BTS has done is driven a lot of their armies to do a lot of reading in Jungian psychology. And that has opened up an incredible amount of information for people much younger than it normally does. I mean, very often people don't even get to the union psychology until they're 35 or 40 years old. Um, and Jung himself didn't particularly think that his work was about the first half of life. Um, you know, basically his view at, in his time, and mind you, he died in 1961. So uh, that was a very different time than now. Um, but his view was that the first half of life is about uh, gaining maturity, getting a job, having children and that sort of thing. But then when you get between 35 and 45, there's typically a shift of what's called the midlife crisis. 
and then people need to have a different perspective on their life and and find a meaning to their life and uh, you know when you're when you have children <laughs> uh, it's very easy to have a meaning to your life because uh, just providing for them is is a big task um, but once you get to the point where the children are grown or almost grown um, then you have to think about what am i going to do for the rest of my life you know what what am i called to do yeah what i'm called to do now and for the last certainly the last decade is to uh, talk about Jung's work and talk about how it has helped me personally. Um, it, ha it has never provided me with an income. I do my work essentially for free. It actually costs me money to do what I do. <laughs> but, um, but the, um, but I think that if we had more knowledge about his work, in the world, uh, we would have less fighting and more, um, you know, just better lives for everyone in the world. And so um, I've been trying to get that message out for 10 years, uh, first with a website called archetypeinaction.com. Uh, but then in the last four years plus on this YouTube channel, and it's gone very well. And so I find it very gratifying uh, to do that. And um, it's, it's more meaningful to me than anything else I've done in my career. Um, and, and so to have, you know, one of the things I wanted to do was to educate people more about Jungian psychology. And so here are these seven young men from Korea and their producer who are uh, promoting it to a whole new generation of young people, uh, which is way more than ever uh, would have heard about it even a decade ago. So, uh, so they're doing what I've been trying to do right along, but you know, I come at it in an old fuddy-duddy kind of way, an old lawyerly business school, you know, <laughs> business executive approach, and, and they're doing it uh, through music and through dance, and, and it's incredibly popular. And so why should I argue with that? Because they're achieving what I have been wanting to achieve all along. Um, yeah. So anyway... Uh, we yeah. have a few more questions here. Yeah. Go ahead. If you Actually, have a question. yeah. So we've, obviously, we've talked about Jungian theory a lot. Would you be able to give like a, I know this is hard to give a brief overview of this whole world, but could you try and, for those who, don't, who aren't familiar, familiar with Jungian theory, could you help them understand? understand? Um, <laughs> this is a big question, be, I know. <laughs> no, no, this is going to blow your mind. I mean, Dr. Jung wrote, 20 volumes in his collected works, and they're about to be reissued in, in something like 26 volumes. Um, but uh, it, it's, believe it or not, it's summed up in the tarot cards. Um, and so this year, I'm dedicating this year, my Monday night classes uh, to um, to teaching about the tarot, not for div divination purposes, but to understand what the archetypes are about. So, um, so let me cover that a, a bit. So Dr. Young was the son of a Swiss reform pastor. And so he and his father had lost his faith. Now, fundamentally, what he was about was the chaos that we're, we all face. Remember what I said about the New York Times earlier in this conversation. So this is my little example of the chaos. We all have a ball of chaos that we face, except it's a, it's a monumental ball because we have way too much information. And so the question is, how do we um, discern what to do with that information? And that huge amount of information. And what 
happened before the uh, 19th century, uh, before the time of Freud and Jung, was that mental health was addressed by the major religions. And so they provided, um, they provided a, a series of basically rules or ideas about how one should conduct one's life so that as you came along in life, you would have a path in order to uh, live a successful and happy life. And, and that worked pretty well um, into the 19th century. But in the beginning of the 16th century, in the f early 1500s, uh, the scientific method began to punch holes in the major religious myths, the stories that uh, religions tell. And so, um, you know, Galileo looked through his telescope and he said, wow, uh, you know, the sun doesn't revolve around the earth, doesn't orbit the earth, the earth or orbits the sun. Okay, that was one of the big things that he said. And it had actually been said by Copernicus about 20 or 30 years earlier too. But Galileo started to talk about that and he got run up by the Inquisition for it and was forced to um, swear on a, on a Bible that the sun orbits the earth. <laughs> and uh, he made a monkey of the Inquisition for all time by, uh, because he knew that they kept good records and that they would keep what he said in perpetuity. And so we actually have the abjuration of Galileo Galilei um, from, I think it's 1519 or 1517, maybe, where he swears on a Bible that the sun orbits the earth. And he knew that he had to do that in order to avoid being burned at the stake uh, and, and in order to avoid being ang having the church be angry with him. But he also knew that the church kept good records and it, he would just make monkeys of them for all time, which he did. And so since his time, um, you know, we've had more and more and more science and people always turned to said, okay, God's up here. And even today, if, uh, uh, wh where do you live, Brian? Do you live in the UK or in Ireland or something? I'm in New York City. Oh, you're in New York City. Okay. Yeah. You, you have a bit of an accent. So I thought yes. it might be. I am Irish. Or I'm okay, Irish, but I live in the US. Yeah. Okay. I have an Irish son in law. <laughs> oh, cool. Uh, but he lives here in Massachusetts. But anyway, um, the point is that. Um, you know, people would point up for, um, for God. And still we have football players who do that when they have a touchdown or a goal in soccer or whatever it is. And, but the fact is, if you look through your telescope and you look through uh, the Hubble telescope, you can see back to the big bang and oh, by the way, there's nobody there. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that God is not there necessarily. God is everywhere and God is most uh, present experientially in one's heart. So if you're going to point at God, you shouldn't do this, you should do this. And um, because it's, it's God that puts the, the will into the football player to get into the gym uh, for a decade or so and to do a lot of running to get to the point where they could run that touchdown or kick that goal, right? And so, but that, you know, that power comes from within. And, um, and Dr. Jung referred to that as both in individuals, he called it the self. In other words, you and I don't know what we're going to be doing two minutes from now. We couldn't predict it to save our lives. Okay, but our 
psyche knows what it wants us to do, okay, ourself. And so Dr. Jung called that the God image also, or the greater personality. We have a, uh, a second personality besides our ego that actually runs our whole life, including, you know, all the automatic functions like um, breathing and heartbeat and everything else that goes on in your body to make you live that's all done unconsciously. And sometimes yourself needs to communicate with your conscious mind, your ego, which is what your conscious mind is. And it does that in two ways. Uh, well, in a number of ways, but two main ways. One is through dreams and the second is through visions. Um, but then it can also do it by um, hairs on the back of your neck or uh, just joy at a BTS concert or whatever, what have, have you. It's, it's an experience. So in psychology, Jung's point is that you can't know anything uh, from a psychological point of view until you experience it. And um, so, for example, if a mother tells a child that the stove is hot, the child hears his mother, but he doesn't know what hot is until he touches the stove. Then he, then he knows what hot is. That's the experience. That's the psychological experience. God is like that. You, don't, you can't know God until you've had an experience of God. And once you've had that experience, then you know. And so uh, what most people don't understand about Dr. Jung's work is that it wasn't really about clinical psychology per se. I mean, he did clinical psychology throughout his career, of course, and interpreted it, he said, about 80,000 dreams in his lifetime. But the most important thing that he wrote about and worked on was uh, religion. And what's significant about what he talked about uh, was that he penetrated to the source of all religions, okay? not to just their baseline story of creation, but the very source of all religions. And, and that's the significance of what he did. So if you take the BTS armies, then, um, you know, if you ask them um, why they, they would never be anything but an army, they, they will say, um, you know, because of the experience I've had with BTS. And so somebody that hasn't had that experience will say, well, this is an odd thing. Um, but in actuality, when you uh, actually have had the experience with these young men, then, then there's no question you're not going to go back. And, you know, that's why when you ask me if I'm a BTS Army for life, I say absolutely, because, um, you know, because I've experienced their message, not just their words, not just what they're trying to convince you of, not just, oh, they have a nice website with the library on it. Um, you know, that's all well and good. But if you actually experience what they've experienced from a psychological point of view and what they're trying to express from a psychological point of view, then there's no question you can't, you won't go back. There's no chance of that. Um, and, uh, you know, a good example of that, um, well, there are several good examples of it, but uh, one is uh, spring day. Okay. And, um, they were able to um, create, to establish the essence of what everyone in the world that knew anything about that particular day. And you see, it makes me emotional just talking about both the day and the, and the song. Um, they were able to express the morning that everyone in the world 
who knew anything about the situation uh, was felt and um, and it's not just the words in the music, it's also the music video, it's also the fact that they were had committed themselves for a significant period of time to get that message out. Um, the um, uh, another one is um, I, I don't remember the name about exactly. It's something about Omelas and um, and society and and so on. I I don't. I don't have it at the top of my mind at the moment, but um, but there are many songs which express the experience that all of us have. Okay, all of us have a have a experience of being shut out by society um, and being treated as outsiders. Okay, that happens to everybody, and. Certainly, it's an experience that many young pe people have, and and uh, so that message, just to the appreciation of that me message, to know other people have experienced that same thing, is a, is a big deal. It's a significant deal, and it's a it, it is a, the essence of mental health, and so. Um, so what I would say is that Dr. Jung was about the way your psyche actually works as opposed to the way somebody who follows the scientific method wants to say it works statistically. And, um, and so I mean, that's the popularity of the Red Book, let's say. The Red Book was a, a basic um, book that he worked on for 16 years at the beginning of his major writing. Um, and he called it his prima materia, his main business. And it it's about irrationality. In other words, um, the scientific method has sold us rationality, everything has to be rational in the world. Well, that that's actually not true. Okay, so if you look at everything that you, is in your room at the moment, with the exception of living beings, uh, everything else is the result of logos, of logic, of rationality. And we, so we need that 100% because nothing that you own, including the computer you're looking at to see me at this moment, uh, none of it is alive. It has to be made perfectly. Okay, so we need logos, we need rationality. And so everything that you have in your room, everything that's in my room behind me, or in front of me on my desk, every single thing had to be made perfectly. It had to be beautiful in, in our eyes, in order for us to care to have it in our lives, but none of it is alive. It's all dead. Okay. And so Eros, which has been dumped on by rationalists and philosophers for uh, generations, uh, is actually where life is. Okay. And so we need to rethink that. And so Dr. Young said it right in the beginning of the Red Book. I can read you a couple of paragraphs right at the beginning that <clears throat> really sum this up. It's in a, it's in a, um, uh, a chapter called The Way of What is to Come. But this, what he's, mind you, he was having visions of people who were in his psyche. And so we can talk about these things as um, complexes that are expressing themselves to us, to our conscious mind by appearing like a actual living being. Okay, and, and that's happened to me many times, but um, 
but it happened to Dr. Young. And, um, and so here's what he wrote in the first two paragraphs of this book. Um, he said, um, and so I'm reading from the Red Book uh, by C.G. Young. If I speak in the spirit of this time, I must say no one and nothing can justify what I must proclaim to you. Justification is super <clears throat> superfluous to me since I have no choice, but I must. I have learned that in addition to the spirit of this time, there is still another spirit at work, namely that which rules the depths of everything contemporary. The spirit of this time would like to hear of use and value. I also thought this way, and my humanity still thinks this way. But that other spirit forces me nevertheless to speak beyond justification, use, and meaning. Filled with human pride and blinded by the presumptuous spirit of the times, I long sought to hold that other spirit away from me. But I did not consider that the spirit of the depths from time immemorial and for all of the future possesses a greater power than the spirit of this time who changes with the generations. The spirit of the depths has subjugated all pride and arrogance to the power of judgment. He took away my belief in science. He robbed me of the joy of explaining and ordering things. And he let devotion to the ideals of this time die out in me. He forced me down to the last and simplest things. The spirit of the depths took my understanding and all my knowledge and placed them at the service of the inexplicable and the paradoxical. He robbed me of speech and writing for everything that was not in his service, namely the melting together of sense and nonsense, which produces the supreme meaning. Okay, so that's the essence of it. So there's a famous psychologist who you probably know named Jordan Peterson, and he calls himself the savior of the logos, among other things, and he's served uh, an important role for young men in the last five years, let's say, uh, because he's provided some traction for the logos, but he he tends to name drop Dr. Young's name, and he and he's left out the fact that Dr. Young was actually talking about the other side of the equation. He wasn't talking about logic he was talking about eros and and the other and the things that keep us alive that actually are our life okay so um uh, and then I don't know, I, that's sort okay. of a thumbnail but <laughs> yeah no, no no it's okay so so map of the soul persona and map of the soul seven obviously you talk about the persona and the shadow and the ego I think we touched on the ego. Would you be able to give a kind of explanation of the persona versus the shadow for just for viewers who may not know? Um, well, the shadow um, is certainly everything that's in your unconscious, okay, first of all. And so there are many good things in the shadow as well as, um, as you know, the, the idea of the shadow uh, suggests that um, that it's all bad, okay? But it's not. <laughs> the reality is that that uh, you know we we can't all be perfect little kitties that go to church on Sunday and wear a perfect outfit and uh, and therefore God will be kind to us, okay? Because uh, this is what Job learned. And so one of um, Dr. Young's most important works is called Answer to Job, uh, because Job was a man in the Old Testament who God was abysmal to. He made, God made a bet with the devil, and the bet was that um, the devil could make Job denounce God. And 
And so that was what the devil was trying to do. And so he came at Job every way he could. Uh, you know, he killed off his parts of his family. He made him sick. He did all kinds of horrible things to Job. And Job recognized that God also has a dark side, okay, that, um, you know, people wonder about, let's say, the coronavirus right now. Well, the coronavirus is coming from God, too, and, and it's a dark side, and, it, and it's killed um, millions of people, or it's killed nearly a million people globally so far, and it may kill many more before it's done. And, and so that's a part of God, too. And so Job, what Job did was he recognized that God has a dark side, too. And, and he appealed to God's good side. In other words, he said, okay, I recognize you have a, a light side and a dark side. I'm going to appeal only to the light side. And so finally, uh, God relented and gave Job a good life for many years after this bet was over, <laughs> uh, because Job recognized that, that even God has a dark side. And uh, so, you know, we've all done things in our lifetimes that we're not proud of doing, uh, that might be considered a sin by the church, for example. And the church, one of the things that um, the church did was uh, it ruled evil out of the equation and said everything is good. Okay, the Christian church did that. And uh, the problem is the devil does exist. There is evil in the world. It's a great power. And um, I'll just give you an example of the devil's trick, okay? Um, and the, the devil's trick is to make you believe something is important while lo causing you to lose something that's very valuable to you, okay? So uh, there's a couple of psychiatrists. I've had my own experience with it, and and uh, Ann Ulanoff, who you can see an interview with on my YouTube channel, um, have both talked about it. I, I'll give you my example first. Um, when my daughter was 22 years old, she had fallen in with um, Christian fundamentalists in Russia. Uh, she had been to Russia for a, a USIS scholarship. And when she came back, she was steeped in this fundamentalism. And on her 22nd birthday, I took her out to dinner. And she and I had a lovely dinner together. We had been together around the world doing all kinds of things for most of her life. And um, I had her in Japan for five years, for example. And, um, and she and I had gone to China together in 1994, and just the two of us had gone, um, and this is 99, and um, after this lovely dinner that we talked for three hours about all these things we had done, um, just before she left me, she said, well, Dad, I'm sorry to say this to you, but I think you're going to hell, and right at that moment, I dropped into hell. And um, on the drive home uh, from Washington to Annapolis, which is a 35 mile drive, um, Mephistopheles, the, the devil that I imagined from Faustus when I read it in college, plopped down in the seat next to me. I had a vision of Mephistopheles, a, a literal vision of him. And um, I cut the Faustian bargain and the bargain I cut was that he could have my immortal soul on my death, provided none of my daughters would think that of me for the rest of my life. And he disappeared, and he never came back in the 21 years since then. Um, and so 
it, but I said to myself, okay, so here's where the devil's trick comes in. I said to myself, who teaches a child to say such a thing to a parent? I was angry with those people. Okay. I was not angry with my daughter. And if I had, if I had aimed my rage at my daughter, I probably would have lost my daughter. Okay, that would have been the devil's trick. That would have been the, the evil outcome of that event. That if I had aimed my rage at my daughter, I probably would have lost my daughter. But as it happens, I, we have very good relations uh, to this day. And, um, and so that's what the devil's trick is. So another context that could come up is if a young man, let's say, or a young woman uh, announces to parents that they're gay, um, one, one way for a, a father, let's say, to respond to a son who says that is, um, you know, you've got to straighten up, you know, you've got to be a man, you know, stop doing that sort of stuff. And in, and that's the best way you, you can lose your son. Okay. That's the best way to lose, lose your child in that case. Whereas if you, um, if you react to your son as your son and, and put your love for that child above anything else, then you're going to have a relationship with your son for the rest yeah. of your life, regardless of what yeah. happens in, in the, in the sexual orientation. And yeah. so, so that's what, and that was the example Anna Ulanoff gave, which was that, you know, the devil's trick is to make, have you instead of addressing the issue, you know, mm. aim your rage at your child and you're going to lose your child if you do that. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah. Right. And so, um, I don't know if, <laughs> I don't know where it's we okay. got into that, but yeah. So I was just asking like, for people who don't understand the idea of the persona and the shadow. Oh, okay. So the shadow, yeah. so, so the shadow is the, is evil in that sense. And, um, but the shadow is also, um, the, has good parts. It's the part of you that says, um, no, I'm not going to be another sheep that goes and runs a machine for 40 years. I'm going to, um, make something of myself and build, build myself up, uh, so that I can achieve something, uh, great. And so, you know, we, we all have trauma in our lives. And there's a very good book uh, called Trauma and the Soul. And I keep it at my fingertips. This is the book, uh, Trauma and the Soul. And so we all have trauma in our lives. Um, yeah. And I've had many traumas. I, the reason that I stopped my career in the Marine Corps was I broke my leg. The last thing I did in uniform was to break my leg. <laughs> and, and so that was pretty traumatic. I was flat on my back for 13 weeks. And, and I had a prosthesis put in my leg when I was 43. And I had to have my ankle replaced uh, two years ago, uh, because of that break. And that sort of trauma causes a lot of readjustment. And yeah. so, um, so, but something comes from your inner self that says, I'm going to find a solution to this. And the same with, with my daughter's confrontation about me going to hell. Um, you know, a, a power comes, comes to you in trauma that finds a resolution to the problem, whatever it is. I mean, it may yeah. be uh, the loss of a girlfriend or it could be the loss of a parent or whatever it is. But when you have trauma, that's when um, 
that's when the angel comes and helps you. I mean, that's what happened to Christ. It happened yeah. to Jesus Christ in Geth Gethsemane. Right. right. And then the persona, how would you just give it like a, as an idea of what that actually is? What would you say? Well, the per persona is how you represent yourself to the world. So, um, so what you're seeing in front of you now with me is I'm presenting myself as a, as a aficionado of Jung and a fan of BTS. I purposely went and put my purple shirt on. I did uh, notice. <laughs> You didn't even notice. No, I did. I did notice. I did. I, I was like, that, that has to be for BTS. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah. I purposely put my, my purple shirt on and I'm purposely using my virtual background, which is CG on Smologen. And, and those two things symbolize what this conversation is about. And, um, you know, another symbol that's here obviously is my wedding ring. Uh, and uh and so you know my my persona includes being a husband to my wife but it it includes being uh a well informed layman on union psychology i'm not a mental health professional but i'm a, i'm a well informed layman and uh it includes being a a, a army for bts well, if if you were, you know, to one day get to meet BTS, would you have what, what would you say to them if you could meet them? Keep going, keep doing what you're doing. Um, try to help other other bands, and and they're doing this. Actually, they're doing this because they're doing these uh, collab collabs with other artists. Um, but they need to we need more of what they're doing to educate young people. Um, because I mean, just think of it in all your years of going to school, <laughs> didn't you always just dread it wasn't a drudgery to have to study for exams and, and, uh, you know, work through all the coursework and all that stuff. Just imagine here, these guys are doing what they're doing and they're, causing people to say, oh, what are they reading? I have to know what that is, and I have to study that. I mean, what a phenomenal turn of events to, to be able to cause people to want to learn and to study and to find out about that. Okay, and so, um, you know, um, so I'm, I'm trying to do it too, because I mentioned earlier the Tarot. Well, the Tarot is, is a system that is worked up just like religions have worked up over centuries. And it basically in the major arcana deals with the major archetypes that we run into in our lives. And the minor arcana uh, deal with the major events of our lives. And one of the things that Jung was working on throughout his life was the idea of individuation. Um, and so that means um, making the most out of your four functions, okay? Your, your function of sensing, your function of uh, intuiting, uh, understanding things, your uh, your function of thinking through things and your function of actually having emotions so that you can enjoy your life, whether it's having an ice cream cone or kissing your girlfriend, whatever it is, you have to have emotions too, right? And so individuation would be uh, getting to the point where you're replicating what the king and queen is in all four of the suits of the minor arcana. Okay, and we all are tending toward one or two of them, uh, but we need to uh, become better at the, at the others. And, um, and, and so, and the major arcana are about the major people and uh, 
experiences that one has in life. And so, but they, they're not touchable. In other words, the archetypes are not something that you can put your finger on. Um, they're, uh, they're, let's call them riverbeds through which our energies run. And so, for example, the one of the classic ones is mother, okay, which is Empress, the Empress card. And she represents our mother. And, um, you know, a woman before she's a mother has, has the structure within her psyche to be a mother, but she's not a mother yet. But once she is a mother, then the energy flows through that riverbed, um, that structure. And then she's a mother and she's a mother for the rest of her life. And there's no questioning <laughs> about that, I mean. And, and so if, if, we, if we understand these things, then we, then we can use them as a structuring that isn't, it isn't necessarily tied to a religion per se. It's tied to a structure that has been used in divination for hundreds of years and therefore it's refined uh, just as astrology is, has done. And um, we, can, we can see our lives in that mirror and therefore understand the types of things that we should be thinking about to make our life fuller, wholer, or to achieve the individuation process that Dr. Jung was talking about, which as I said, would suggest that you get to the top of each of the four suits, uh, not just one of them. Um, you know, for example, our president right now, he is the poster boy of the suit of coins, the sensing suit. So he's achieved everything that one could possibly want in terms of money, material world. Um, but, but is he happy? Okay, is that man happy? And the problem is that, that it's pretty clear that he is not happy personally. Um, and in order to be happy personally, he would have had to develop uh, the three other characteristics. And I'm not saying he hasn't developed them partially, but, uh, but he's rather limited on feeling, for example. Um, and so, you know, what do you do with that? I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So, oh. I, so in terms of what I would say to BTS, I'd say teach other groups to do the same thing you're doing, to write songs based on things that they think are important, and put you know put books or other references to those things on your website, and change people's attitude about education from it's drudgery, I've got to go to school to, wow, I really want to know more about this type of thing. That's what I would urge them to do. Such and, a great way uh, of putting it. That comparison yeah. between, because I think I, I, I know I've experienced that drudgery and I think a lot of people have and music Surely. feels, music feels, and especially BTS, it feels the exact opposite of that drudgery. It feels it's very kind of compelling and you really want to know more about it. So when you hear it, so it's right. a great way to put it. Right. Yeah. And that's how to educate people. That's how young people will be educated. Yeah. So, well, is there anything else you'd like to add? Okay. Uh, well, I don't, um, I, I just like to ask you, um, what is, what is your objective and on your site? You're, you have a YouTube channel, I gather. Yeah. So, right? Yeah. So I come from a journalism background. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I spent a lot of time covering, you know, I started covering uh, when I, in, you know, when I first started my career, I covered politics and breaking news and really, really heavy stuff. And I did it for, you know, a good, a good six, almost seven years um, mm -hmm. full time. And I just <clears throat> decided that ultimately it just doesn't make me happy to, to write about and think about these 
like I would cover shootings, like, and I worked mm-hmm. in, I work in the US, so I cover a lot of shootings in my job. And it just yeah, begins yeah. to weigh on you, you know, like, it, it, I feel sure. like you kind of experience your own trauma. So I think what I'm trying to do more of is, you know, kind of work on things that make me happy. And one of those things is BTS and is, is music in general, but that's kind of right. what I'm trying to do is just do things, that, do, well, do more things that make you. me happy. So. Let me point you to an Irish poet, um, David White, W-H-Y-T-E, if you don't know his name. Um, He's about my age, I suppose, now. But one of the things that he said, I I bought tapes of his readings maybe 30 years ago, but he's still around. He's on Facebook and and so on. And he said, um, don't look for the news in newspapers, okay, because they don't carry the news. Look for the news in poems. Um, And what he's referring to, I think, when he said that, um, and I've remembered that piece of advice for 30 years at least, is that is the collective unconscious, which Dr. Jung was talking about, and and the fact of, you know, what what is art? What are the arts saying about where we are as a species right now, or where we are as Americans right now, or where we are as Irish right now, whatever it is? And you know, I obviously, if you read the famous uh, Irish poets, you can get a pretty good idea of what it's the the way an Irishman thinks, right? And um, if you, you know, read some of the great documents of, of the American history that are uh, poetic or accepted as poetic, such as the Declaration of Independence or the, uh, the Constitution, um, then you know where we are as as human beings okay we're all people every in this in this particular country we're all people who have come from somewhere else we've all come to look for something better than what we had previously and and that's true of every human being in the americas okay because even the so-called native americans came across the bering land bridge sometime in the last 35,000 years. People disagree about when that happened, but but the reality is that if you want to know what what um, Native American is like, go to the Indian Festival in, in uh, Gallup, New Mexico, and see what they're selling in their, of their art and so on and in their poetry and you're going to know something about their culture and their unconscious right Mm. and so uh so what what i'm saying to you is you're on the right track and you should emphasize that because our culture is really where the news is Okay, and the the events in the newspaper will take care of themselves one way or another. There's there's uh, obviously a give and take going back and forth, and there's lots in union psychology about that. But mm-hmm. but the unique thing of union psychology is the collective unconscious, and what is going on in the collective. So what is going on in the psyches of armies? Okay, and if I say I'm one, maybe I've given you a sense of some of the things that are going on in my psyche, but I can't tell you, I I can't have you experience what I've experienced. I can only say pointers to you but you have to experience it for yourself. And so what, you know, people who haven't had that experience, you know, they probably are not going to believe, Um, but you've experienced it with BTS. So, you know, you've had this urge to educate yourself 
And that's what we need in education. I mean, that's why I say they've done the most important thing in the last 50 years in education, because all of a sudden they've turned the whole process on the head. And now I want to learn instead of I have to do it to do this. And I've done that too. I mean, you know, getting a law degree or an MBA, those are, those are drudgery type of things. But, you know, for the last, I'd say 15 to 20 years, I've been totally turned on to, to learning on my own about Jung. And so I don't need a teacher, I'm teaching myself, right? And, yeah. and that's what BTS is doing. And so, that's wonderful. Uh, yeah. so I, so I think it, that your approach to look at culture and to understand something about the collective and what's going on in the collective is important. It's very important. Um, and we have Thank plenty you. of, yeah. you know, we have plenty of people who, you know, get it, who took a journalism course and, and so they know how to go out and ask, you know, who, what, what, when, where, why, and how, and, and all of that's, you know, but, you know, anybody can do that. It's, you know, but the question is, what's really happening? <laughs> you know, what's really yeah. happening? Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, great. and so, you know, that's why Jung got in trouble when he was asked, do you believe in God? And he says, I have no need to believe because I know. And, and uh, he got in trouble because people thought he knew God in the sense of, um, of Christianity, the way Christianity is, is taught. And that isn't what he meant at all. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. Wow. Well, this is this is uh, such a. I feel like I've learned so much. It's been such a great conversation, Skip, and I so appreciate you taking the time to really educate me and kind of explain what you're doing. And it's fantastic. So, yeah. thank you so much. I just I, I refer you to one other thing, and that's a yeah. talk I did last fall, uh, which is on the YouTube channel, my YouTube channel, uh, and it's called uh, Finding the Living God. And uh, in that talk, which is a couple of hours long, I talk about my own personal experiences um, with God and, and where you find the living God. And, and uh, it's what Nietzsche didn't understand when he said God is dead. Mm. Okay. Mm. Yeah, I'll be sure to check that out. Yeah, great. Okay. So, anyway. Yeah. All right. Peace. Oh, Skip, nice thank you so much. You. Yeah, I will send you the recording of this. If that works. Great. Um, sure. And do you have any? Do you have any photos of you from throughout your? If you want to like send me some photos from throughout your various careers that you've had, or like more recent oh, yeah. photos, just for inclusion. If that's, I don't know if you have any, any BT, BTS merchandise or anything like that at home, or you know whatever photos you have, if you could send them on, that'd be great. Well, I, I mean, I. Um... Yeah, <laughs> even a purple shirt is great. So, I mean, you could always take a, a screenshot of my purple shirt. Maybe we should. That's great. Maybe we should do that right now here. Uh, well, oh, I can uh, just I can screen I can screen grab I can just do a screen grab after of of, of as you are right, right now. So no worries. Okay, as as yeah. I am right now, I'll send you a couple of other pictures, which will probably surprise you.